growing a pale brand, I think it comes down to really, you know, building your line smart, not overbuying inventory, uh, like learning what true like add to market fit is and bringing your brand along the way so you can continue to scale across every channel. Hey, Modern Commerce, welcome back. You're here again with Casey and John. We're at it again with another hard-hitting interview today. We're continuing on our How to Build a Brand series today. Uh, John's lined up another fantastic interview for us. John, how are you doing, and who do you have for us today? Doing good, man. Thanks for asking. Uh, I'm excited about today's. We've had a, a little series here on apparel, where we've had a few apparel brands in a row. Uh, so excited to continue that with the co-founder of Western Rise, um, a brand that I love personally, uh, Mr. Will Waters. Will, how, thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. How are you? And uh, yeah, give me a little background, a little background on you, a little background on Western Rise. Tell us how it all started. Yeah, uh, I'm Will Waters. Uh, I grew up in Rome, Georgia. Um, live in Telluride, Colorado, which is where Western Rise is based. Um, small ski town in Southwest Colorado. Um, we started Western Rise back in 2016. Um, like I said, I grew up in Georgia. My grandfather started one of like the oldest textile mills in the Southeast. My dad turned into a commercial fabrics business. Um, I grew up kind of helping them with textile development, um, yarn development, things like that. Um, ended up moving to uh, Vail, Colorado, where I was a ski instructor for what was supposed to be one season and stayed there for four and a half years. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and became a fly fishing guide in the summers. So nice. Um, yeah, I was kind of just bouncing around like Vail, Colorado for a bit um, and had this idea for one set of clothing that kind of transitioned for everything we would do in a day. Uh, so from hiking to biking to you know, guiding fishing to dinners out. So kind of taking my fabrics and textile background and applying high performance textiles to clothes you could wear kind of all day, every day, um, which is a pretty novel concept. Uh, we ended up kind of working on the brand and then launching like, like 2015, 2016, um, moved to Telluride, Colorado for a startup accelerator program in 2016 and have been running the company here since. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So launch in 2016, what did launch look like, uh, for you? <laughs> uh, a messy side project at first. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what were you doing at the time? Like, were you, like, what was your full-time gig? So I, I was actually working for my father's fabrics business, uh, doing textile development and new product development. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, I, I was helping them basically launch companies within, I guess, this broader, larger company. Um, right. Yeah, so a lot of international sourcing, a lot of textile and yarn development, um, kind of building on that. And then worked on this on the side for a little while. It takes a long time to get a clothing brand to launch because basically you have to you know, source samples from overseas. Like, find the fabrics, find the yarns, find the trims, find like, right. all the, the pieces and put it together. And then um, prior to launch, we did a lot uh, a lot of organic building on, on Instagram. It was very early days for Instagram, um, before Facebook bought Instagram. So we, we did a lot of just kind of teasers, brand building, like lifestyle building. At the time, we were far more uh, of an outdoor focused brand, I would say, like transitional outdoor. And so we had this pretty good following there when we launched and launched it was really successful for us actually. Yeah. Did you launch on Kickstarter or did you, did you launch crowdfunding? Remind me. So we didn't launch, uh, when we originally launched, we did not launch on, on crowdfunding. We, when we went full time with the brand, we, I would call it like almost our second launch and that was on Kickstarter. Yeah. Okay. So we, we kind of wow. sold like our initial collection, uh, which is a really tight, small collection. Um, all organic, all bootstrapped, all, you know, just to our, our Instagram audience. And then realized we kind of had something there, went back to the drawing board, kind of redesigned what we were doing as a brand a little bit, uh, resourced everything, and then went back to Kickstarter and launched our really like what's still our core product uh, called the Evolution Pen. Casey, you are an absolute beast right now. You're turning out so many creatives across multiple brands. What is it that is so hard about producing such a high volume of creatives? Why can't a lot, why can't more brands do it? 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, I would say if you're doing it the right way, of course, um, you should be always analyzing your your past ads, you know, the things you've already turned out, your most recent uh, test group that you've put out. Um, and that should inform your next round of creation, not just go all willy nilly about it. So I would say that's why it's difficult to speed up that process is because it's always kind of a two pronged approach of, of analyzing and creation, really. So how is it that you are able to do that across like 12 to 15 accounts? Yeah, I mean, it does get pretty wild. But honestly, when I use pencil, it's not as bad. Uh, pencil is a tool that I use. It, it's got AI that'll help determine what my best ads are. It'll even break it down into the best elements of those ads. And in that platform, it'll automatically generate new ads for me to launch. And I can push them live straight from the platform uh, into Facebook, IG. Um, it also works great for other platforms as well, like TikTok, whatever you're on, really. If you sound like me and you're always in the weeds with your creatives, you need, you need a little bit more analytics. Uh, you just need some help with new creation. You need things to be sped up a little bit. Um, you know, Use our promo code. Go to trypencil.com. Use promo code modcom15. You'll save 15% off on any paid plan. You sure can start with a free plan, John. I mean, hey, I'll recommend it. Go ahead and try it for free. But once you do, we're pretty confident you're going to want to switch to a paid plan anyway. So don't forget you can use that promo code modcom15 at trypencil.com. One more time. That's trypencil.com, modcom15. Save 15% off any paid plan they have there. And uh, back to the show. Cool. So, I mean, you, you got into this a little bit here, like challenges of launching an apparel brand. And and that's really kind of like this whole series, the whole point of it is uh, to not just speak to e-commerce broadly, um, because I think uh, there's a lot of info out there that's like really tactical uh, sure. around e-commerce growth that the people who are making it, they're actually thinking of like some specific use case for it. And, uh, and if you actually don't have that use case, like if that use case doesn't apply to your brand, then it's like very confusing or it just doesn't work for you or something like that. So, yeah. uh, we want to hit on that and, and trying to split it up by vertical, right? Like I do want to hit on that, you know, uh, what is, what is unique and difficult? What is uniquely difficult about launching a, uh, and, and let's stick with launch for now, uniquely difficult about the early stages of, of launching an apparel brand. Um, I think there's a handful of different challenges. <laughs> uh, one, because my background is more product, I'll start there. Um, yeah. Like from a product standpoint, you're one of the hardest parts with apparel is like sizing and skews. Um, mm -hmm. Where like you know in a typical CPG product, you may have you know one to three skews, you know just with like one style of pants across say five colors with you know, eight sizes per color, that's 40 SKUs in one style, just to get started. And not only that, um, you have to create, basically, uh, you, know, you have to fit every single size from like 28 through 40 to make it all fit appropriately. And then if you start adding inseam links to that on top of that, you triple those SKUs by adding, you know, each inseam link that you're adding to it. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot going on there between um, you know creating like all the different sizing and making sure all the sizing and fitting is right, and then having like your standardized like fit block, um, and then also just how much skew proliferation can happen quickly because just launching with one style of pants is not enough to like really build a brand around that's kind of having a product like <laughs> versus right. like in CPG, yeah. Right. Well, and I, that so that's what's interesting is that like in in uh, I've, I've literally had another like uh, pant disruptor, gene disruptor on the show. Uh, Perfect okay. gene, you're probably cool. familiar. Yeah. Um, and the same thing. I was like, how many like products do you have? I think there are like eight. Yeah. How many SKUs do you have? And I think they're like uh, like 3,000 or something like that. Like, yeah, you're, you're yeah, really totally. high, right? And this is yeah. something that if you're not in clothing, specifically pants, pants in particular have like so many multipliers on their sizing. You have inseam, you have waist. Uh, you have color, right? Like it's, you know, whereas like shirt, there's usually that many, there's not that many multipliers, but right. um, yeah. foot, footwear is another one that has multiple multipliers usually. Um, but like, yep. yeah, I mean, that that's, that's a big one that I will say with apparel, you know, it may seem simple. It may seem simple to launch an apparel brand because it's just like, I mean, cause there, to me as a marketer, there's some very obvious like advantages or uh, like we kind of talked about the unique challenges, 
There's also right. the flip side of that where there's some unique advantages or uh, unique things that will not be as challenging to you because you're launching apparel instead of CPG or supplements or something like that, right? Sure. Um, but one of the things that will be like, if you just aren't someone who, everybody who I've talked to who launches a, an apparel disruptor brand, um, if, if they all have apparel backgrounds, right? Like they all have textile backgrounds, apparel, like that's what they have done in their career prior to that. So the logistical management of <laughs> launching that many SKUs over that few sizes, knowing which ones you'll need, you know, what's like super hard if you've never worked in apparel at all is knowing how many of each each waist and each inseam and each inseam within each waist to actually buy. Right. Yes, exactly. Cause then once you start breaking sizes too, like conversion rate drops considerably, like marketing yeah. is much harder. Yeah. That's exactly it. Your, your most popular sizes run out and you're sitting on all of these, you know, 42, 42s or something like that. Right. <laughs> exactly. like, like, what am I going to do with these? Uh, yeah. same with footwear. Like I worked in retail footwear and it is like even buying in retail is like, okay, so, for men, I need to buy like 50 size 10s and then like probably, you know, 45 size 10 and a half. And then you get to like 12 and it's like, and it needs to be 15. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it yeah. Dropped. And once you know, you know, but before that, curve. exactly. The, yeah. the re, especially the, the, the suppliers, they're going to, they're going to send you a suggested PO that looks very different. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they want to buy all their big. <laughs> off sizes and stuff like that so uh yeah like you don't want to get caught holding that bag you know totally yep especially in your first season it's really hard to like you know project what your customer base is going to buy because it may not be the standard like you know 32 bell curve like most people have um you may be advertising to an audience that's like a little larger so you might end up with like a customer's average size like being a 34 or 35 so, yeah, dead on. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's great. That's a, those are some of the unique challenges. Um, and then, uh, what would you say are maybe some of the the things that are the upsides if you're if you're launching if you're in launch phase the upsides of launching an apparel brand as opposed to other types of e-commerce brands? You know, I think on the upside, like launching an apparel brand is also really cool. Like, there's a there, there's like a cool factor there. Uh, you can curate like a lifestyle around that where like you might not be able to do that as much with like, you know, a shampoo and soap brand. Like yeah. there's a, there's a little bit more um, cachet to like, you know, launching an apparel brand. Um, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. Like when you start looking at like what guys wear on a continual basis, it's uh, you know, the same 20 items they've worn for the past, you know, we'll call it 75 years basically. So, um, you know, we're reinventing it with new fabrics and technologies that are available now that weren't available then, but, you know, you're still not deviating from the core, like button down t-shirt pan. Like yeah. it's uh, it's pretty simple. So, um, yep. Yeah, exactly. Women's definitely a little bit harder, a little bit more of a challenge there. Um, but for men's it's a, uh, it's pretty simple. So. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I would say too, that it's like, you know, um, it, it, and this is weird. It's weird to call it commodities, right? Because it's like, yes, everybody needs to wear clothes, but not of everybody needs to wear the DTC type clothes. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, of course. Uh, you know, plenty of people probably should just maybe buy, be buying stuff at like Walmart. Um, and that, that should be <laughs> what the clothing budget is or whatever. Uh, but I mean, there's something to it, right? Like look good, feel good. Like that's a thing. And everybody kind of knows it. Um, and you don't have to explain it to people, right? So like if you have a supplement or if you have some kind of product that solves somebody's pain, um, it's great. Like it's a great marketing opportunity to be able to solve a pain. But uh you're going to have to, ex you're going to have to sell them on the idea and then sell them on the product. Like you did not have to sell anyone on the idea of pants, right? Like right. they were al already yeah. sold on that idea. And you're like, Hey, you should try these pants. Here's why. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like Casey used to sell insurance. And, and one of the things he said is like, if somebody came in to my office and like started talking about how they didn't believe in insurance at all, like, and I'm going to now have to sell them on the idea of insurance and then sell them mine. But he's like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm just going to be like, yeah, you're right. you, I, I think you should go. Like, um, so, so like, yeah, no, I, I think um, that is one of the advantages. Another advantage I will say in apparel, I think is actually even more so than supplements and consumables. I've seen the highest lifetime values in apparel and especially in men's, you know, yeah, uh, men are like, we're very simple in the way we shop. If we find something we like, we're just going to buy every color of it. And then when yep. those ones wear out or if we get fatter or something like that, we're just going to buy more of that one. You know, like that, 
that's how we shop. So um, there is loyalty there, and then there's strong LTVs. No, you're completely right. I would say like hard to get to convert. Like at first, hard to get to change to a new clothing brand, but once you get someone to convert and the product is right, LTV is very high. Yeah. So, good on. So. Uh, cool. So let's let's go through journey a little bit. So 2016, you launch. You come back. You you, you bring it. When when were you like full time Western Rise? This is my whole full time gig now. Um, probably 2018. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like 2018 was when we launched our, like early 2018, we launched our Kickstarter campaign. We did $600,000 in the first 30 days on Kickstarter. So that was, uh, at the time it may still be actually like the largest pants Kickstarter campaign ever. Yeah. Um, so that was a, that was a huge win for us. We kind of validated like the, the brand, like true launch at that point, um, kind of went full time, realized we had something here, um, like continue to scale from there. Um, so, and then, so uh, probably, yeah, yeah. So, so let's stop there for a second because you went full time with the brand, um, which you do that at at the point at which you're like, hey, you know what? Like this, there is something here. This isn't just going to go out of business tomorrow. There's not, you know, this isn't some unvalidated thing with no product market fit. There's something right. here. So, uh, what what are the keys to? So we talked about launch a little bit. What are the keys to, and again, looking at apparel specifically, what are the keys to like validating product enough to know, okay, we're validated. We have product market fit, you know, and, and maybe, maybe it's a revenue level and maybe I'm talking about rev level, you know, zero, yeah. you know, not even zero, you know, it's because past zero. So maybe I'm talking about rev level, you know, 250 K or 100 to 250 K a year up to, you know, one to 2 million type point where you're like, okay, this is, this is validated enough for me to, to do this full time. Like it's not, there's not, this isn't a house of cards, you know? Yeah. I'd like to say that like, we knew exactly what point that was, but I don't think we ever really did. Like <laughs> there wasn't like a, a, a defined number there where we were like, yep, it's time. Um, you know, there was just like from 2016 to 2018, there was like, you know, we, we like, we're kind of out there searching, trying to find like, what the true like hero product of the brand was going to be like, or if there was going to be a hero product, of the brand uh, and kind of played around with like, you know, wholesale a bit. Uh, maybe I think we've raised a false small funding round in like 2017 that kind of like opened up some opportunity, like, okay, I can start to step away some from, from what I've been doing in the past and kind of lean into to this new idea and just like, at least give it some, some full-time effort and you know, start to fully focus like a lot of my time on it. And then, you know, it takes a long time, like I said, to like get a sample ready. And we were trying to like tease out this, you know, this product before we launched our Kickstarter in 2018. And we were starting to see some pretty early traction and people really excited about it and could kind of feel that it was going to go well. And I feel like the Kickstarter campaign really just truly validated that we had like a legitimate hero product. And beyond just having product market fit, I think one of the more important things is we had what I'd call like you know, ad market fit as well. And we're able to like scale there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was like, okay, like this is going to be repeatable after, like after this campaign, um, you right. know, we were running really pretty much like fully bootstrapped still at that point. So unfortunately we, we sold a ton in our Kickstarter campaign and then I hadn't forecasted that we were going to have the biggest pants Kickstarter ever. So, so we were a little delayed on production and getting stuff live on the site. So, you know, we basically had to run through like that, call it six month span of just fulfilling as many Kickstarter orders as we possibly could in the short amount of time um, and started getting great feedback then. And then it's like the second we launched on the site, it just kind of started to take off from there. So, right. Yeah. yeah no, uh, and, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's different for everybody. Like what is traction? What does, you know, launch look like? What does launch to traction look like? I mean, what does traction mean to you? Everybody has yeah. different levels of risk and, and things like that. Um, yeah. but I think a couple things, like you said, add to market fit where it's like, Hey, you know, not only do, are people buying this, but people engage with these ads, you know, people yeah. click people like, like, this is, this is, there's something here. Like there's a buzz beyond just that people are buying it and you know, people are buying it <laughs> that too. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other one I, I would say is like, you know, are people buying, like once people start buying, you know, more than one pair, like people, you start having repeat purchases. That's another point at which it's like, 
okay, this isn't just going to fold up. You know what I mean? Like people like this and yeah. when they get the product, they like it. Um, so yeah. And then, and then funding, of course, right? Like how much profit are you making if you're bootstrapping or are you doing some kind of round of funding to say, all right, I'm going to yeah. do enough funding to give myself one or two years where, of runway here. Um, or what, you know, so it's a little bit different for everybody, but, um, yeah, I appreciate it. So, um, moving into maybe, okay. Traction is established. You know, we're now like, there's a full-time brand, a full-time gig. What is that sort of like one to 2 million to probably, I mean, let's call it like the sing, the seven figures, right? Getting from the bottom of the seven figures up to the, <laughs> the eight figures. Yeah. What is, what are the keys to that? Uh, in, you know, again, speaking specifically within apparel. Yeah, I think it's, uh, we'll call it two parts. I think there's the product side and there's the marketing side. Um, right. You know, on the product side, like you have to expand out your assortment. You can't just like, well, you could build a seven figure brand off of one style probably. Um, <laughs> but but theoretically for that lifetime value, you need you know other things for someone to come back and buy from you, whether that's going deeper into the same category you're in or like creating full outfits. Um, you know, I think in apparel, you know, traditionally like a retail store has sold like five to one pants or sorry, tops versus pants. Um, right. we, we are completely the opposite of that because we didn't really have any apparel background and we built our pants and we like <laughs> launched our pants first. So we kind of became a pants brand first. Um, but I think it's important to kind of like give someone who is a fan of the brand that kind of full outfit that they can wear, like, you know, top to bottom, like, and some tops. Um, so I think one, you know, you're expanding out the collection. I think you you need to have, you know, five pieces or so, which when you start getting the minimum order quantities, that's that's pretty challenging with apparel. I mean, like we talked about, there's a lot of SKUs there. There's a lot of costs going into that. And, you know, expanding into other categories outside of the one that you're known for is always a risk. So that's always yeah. a challenge. Um, and then on the other side, on the, on the marketing side, um, you know, at that point you've you've run your kickstarter you found a couple ads that are hitting but well, like we all know like ads tap out <laughs> and like you know you need to be able to find like what are the other like emotional triggers for someone to buy the product beyond just like the original like you know one emotional trigger that's currently working um and like what problem you're truly solving for the for the audience and then taking that those couple of emotional triggers that are making someone buy and carrying them into various ad channels, whether that be print or radio or, you know, podcast or whatever that might be. Um, so diversifying, you know, ad spend a bit yeah. as well. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, to add a couple, uh, at least that I've seen, um, and, and I'll actually go the other direction of brands that are like unto apparel brands that I've seen gain traction, have maybe even similar story arcs to you where, you have the number one uh, pants Kickstarter of all time uh, in a more, what I would say, more competitive Kickstarter category, sunglasses. Uh, I used to work with a brand that had the number like two or three campaign of all time and the number four and the number five. Um, and so like a few of their different products. And they got to that seven figure, multiple seven figure level. And then it fizzled, it plateaued, fizzled, died. Right. Um, and why? Like, why does that happen? And uh, you're right. It's like, you know, there's got to be other stuff for people to buy. And in apparel and accessories, I mean, there's really two ways in apparel, right? Like there is your product disruptor, like you are, right? Where it's like, we are disrupting the pants category, right? And, and we're doing it, right. we're doing pants a different way. <clears throat> or your fast fashion. Um, and, yep. and so here, I mean, there, it looks a little different getting from seven to eight figures. If you're fast fashion, it's just, you got to be fast fashion and you got to, you got to make the right, it's almost like being a trader. Like you better be you, not, not a traitor, but like a trader, yeah. like you got to make the right pick, you know, yeah. like you gotta, right. you, you've got to have buyers or yourself or whoever who really understands your market and knows like, I'm going to get the stuff that they want, you know, and there's some kind of community there. If it's the other way where your product disruptor it's yeah, there's got to be extensions. And not only does there have to be extensions, you actually have to keep up, right? So fast fashion, yeah. they're just used to keeping up. Like that's yeah. all they do. Uh, I think that I've seen apparel brands, accessory brands, 
and, and this is what happened with this one, have a tendency to not realize that the style has changed even subtly, like even if it's subtly. And yeah. uh, maybe they launch new products, but you know, not, not new enough or not different enough or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it too. It's like, you got to keep up a little, you got to, you actually, the, the brands that we've seen bridge this gap that like kind of started with like, we are a product disruptor uh, and then bridge the gap would be like chubbies, right? Where it's like, yeah. it started out, Hey, we sell short shorts to dudes. Um, yeah. And now they're a full on, I could, you would almost call them a fast fashion brand now. And that's yeah. almost built, built clothing similar where, yeah. you know, started out with it as a disruptor and now they're doing, you know, quarterly, at least quarterly, seasonally. At least quarterly. Yeah. Lines, yeah. right? Yeah. Like extended lines, right? So they're full on fashion brand almost. Um, they kind of stay true to themselves and what they are, minimalist and stuff like that. But like, you know, so that I, I think there is an evolution toward if you are a product disruptor, uh, then you kind of have to go you don't have to go fast fashion, but like you have to blend more of that in in order to get from seven yeah. figures to eight figures and beyond. And if you're fast fashion, then the thing you always struggle with is like you're on that hamster wheel of like something really works and then it stops working and then yeah. finding winning products, right? So, well, yeah. I think also like, you know, as you get bigger, you know, call it the beyond those, the eight figures there. Like I think the fast fashion component becomes a bit more important because your lifetime value of the customer base you've already built is such a huge portion of your business then. So yeah. these customers yeah. that already own the the 15 products that you make, they're just like begging for more. And so they need quick turnover. So you need to be bringing new product over and over and over again, which means, you know, keeping up with trends a little bit, but also your buys are bigger than at that point and factories will make a quick turnaround product and you can actually yeah. scale into that a little bit easier because you, you know, you have factory capacity at that point. So. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, yeah. The, the, the highest LTV brand I've ever worked with was an apparel brand. I think I've said this multiple times on the show. It was an apparel brand, a little bit of a cheat because it was baby and children's apparel and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. babies grow fast. So uh, that helps. But uh, when they made the shift from doing kind of new products every now and then, quarterly, monthly, whatever, to we, they, they started doing new collection drops every week. That's yeah. hard. Logistically, that's very hard to do. Uh, yeah. That was, I mean, they probably have a way better EBITDA than most of the D2C darlings out there, right? And they've got, yeah. they've got that kind of growth too. Um, yeah. And that, you know, so, so like there's something to it, right? Like they started with these core products that people really loved. But like you said, like, okay, well, I've got all of them, right? Like, give me more, right? Like, <laughs> begging for more. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, thanks. So, and then, I mean, what would you say, I mean, let's jump, let's jump ahead. So eight figures, uh, this is a big category, but like, like, let's say, you know, I think that what we've talked about here and like kind of extending, extending product lines, expanding the brand into new product categories, ext usually expanding across gender, right? If you were primarily men, how can we get into women's? If we were primarily women, yeah. how can we get into men's? Um, that's usually what gets you to about 25, 40, 50 million, something like that. Sure. What would you say is so so kind of you know the if you if you're really trying to go the distance and get to a hundred million, you know, yeah. five like what what is it then, you know? What what are the keys to that? <laughs> um like I well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I'll let you know when we get there. Um yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. yeah. Yeah, no, I think like one, it's expanding the product line pretty significantly, like you said, and like you know, increasing the drops of product. Two, I think, yeah, there's certainly the gender, uh, like diversifying gender there. So adding women's if you're in men's, adding men's if you're in women's. Um, those are both huge and can make a big impact. I think the gender one is, is extremely hard, um, yeah. you know, either direction. I think like yeah. you've curated this like audience and have a certain voice, and then all of a sudden you try and speak to a completely different audience. So unless you're you're breaking that up into like, Two different social medias like it's it's almost like starting a whole another brand um, on top yeah. of your brand so so that one is difficult but i think it is it is necessary to get there um it's it's rare to see the hundred plus million dollar mark without having both genders there um and then you know i think wholesale gets really important in that stage as well so being in a lot of different wholesale locations uh or or we'll take uh 
your own direct retail as well. Like, yeah. you know, that can be like, you know, a big expansion too. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I mean, you know, getting into Macy's, getting in, right? Like that's probably, yeah. that's probably the key to getting nine figures and beyond, right? In terms I of think, what I think, you know, the other thing that you may have to do at that point is price diversification to bring mm -hmm. in some of the middle of the country a bit. <laughs> like, I mean, we have, we have good traction across like, you know, every tier one and tier two city, but you know, if we could create products that are 25% less expensive and a little bit more accessible to, you know, a broader demographic, yeah, it's, it's easier scale for sure. Well, so. and, and you actually see this in the retail side of apparel. Uh, it's, it's one company that owns Gap, Old Navy, and I think Athleta, yeah. Athleta you know? Yeah. It, it, so, so it's like, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, that is kind of established in apparel and it's like, okay, well, if, even if you don't want to like damage the Western Rise brand, cause it's higher end and it's going to be, yeah. All right, well, let's make Eastern Rise then, you know, or whatever. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's> so for sure. <laughs> getting more accessibility is, is, a, is a big key. Um, moving through, so yeah, just a couple minutes left here. Um, kind of want to ask you, like, for Western Rise, and this is maybe just a, a, a topic we can't afford, or the, the, uh, the topic that we can't avoid right now. Um, okay. You guys have been heavy. A, a lot of your growth has been fueled by paid media, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, talk to me about iOS 14 and real bad for you. Not so bad. Maybe, how, how do you think? What do you think? Uh, probably we'll call it medium bad. Medium. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Like, I think like almost every, like, medium. yeah, it's a, <laughs> um, it's definitely been a challenge. I think we've started to figure it out. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of good traction, like exploring other channels and also like, continuing to innovate within the, you know, the paid media channel as well. So, yeah. you know, whether that's, uh, we've leaned in heavily to what we're calling our partner program. So creating you know, ongoing partnerships with various influencers, content creators at different tiered levels that then we can whitelist through. Uh, so we see like higher return on uh, uh, return on ad spend. Um, yeah, and then also like working to create landing pages that help educate a customer on the first visit of the site instead of having to retarget them and and like spend money you know multiple times to convince someone to buy a hundred and twenty eight dollar pair of pants. So you know I think you're just having to get far more thoughtful about how you spend your money and like how you how you run your paid media than like we ever had to before. Uh, that I think. Um, like creative turnover has happened much faster. Like you would wear out, you know, the creative a lot faster than I, I've ever seen in the past. So people are constantly looking for newness. And I don't know if it's, it's as much iOS 14 as it is, you know, TikTok attention spans. <laughs> like, but people like want newness and they want to see like, you know, constant video and, and you know, different reasons to buy a product and, you know, why it's unique. Um, so that's, that's been a bit of a challenge for sure. So it's a, uh, you know, and then beyond that, we've been testing lots of other channels. I mean, we tested Sirius XM radio, we tested programmatic radio, we tested mail, we tested, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So any, any winners in there you care to tell us about? Yeah, sure. I mean, print, print has been great, honestly. Yeah. Uh, we did with our first like uh, mini catalog and trifold. So it's, you know, mm. like great, you great results direct? there. Yeah. We sent out, I think it was our first send was like a hundred thousand pieces. So it's was a that, uh, prospecting or people past customers. Yeah. Or? It was like a 60, 40 blend. Yeah. Okay. Like pro prospecting and like warm audience. So and it, um, and it performed pretty well, huh? Yeah, it did. Yeah. So we're, we're leaning in heavily there. Um, I think we saw some interesting first results from like Sirius XM radio, um, which I think we'll continue to explore more, but I think it's kind of a longer play. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of like you can't turn Facebook ads on for one day and hope to see like the, yeah. the amazing results. There was, <laughs> so, there was time, you know. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it takes a little longer than that. Um, so it's, it's definitely more. Um, you know, we're looking at other channels as well beyond that. Uh, you know, we've looked at, at TV. We're like scaling into YouTube more, which is still like, you know, paid media as well. Yeah. But but uh, a little bit different. Is, is so, Facebook still the king of spend for you guys? Yeah, probably so. Um, yeah. Especially if you combine in like the partner program on top of that and like the whitelisting that we're doing. Um, mm. And then we we partner a lot with like um, 
I'll call it like a blend of paid media and affiliate um, for a lot of like publication partnerships that we do. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, and then we drive, drive traffic to those. And then, uh, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the site traffic for them doesn't necessarily matter. So we can target some interesting, like lower to medium tier, you know, publications and then drive a lot of traffic there and see like a, you know, a high return. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So what do you think? And, and I will say this, uh, it, across the board in apparel for us, media mixing has been the breakthrough, even on digital, right? So yeah, Facebook, if I look back uh, 14, 16 months ago, uh, yeah. for all apparel, Facebook was the king of spend. Um, and sure. we have multiple, I don't know, I would say most outside of big buying moments, like, you know, probably for you, Father's Day or Q4, um, yeah. Google actually takes up a bigger uh, portion of spend all Google properties. Yeah. So you, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just, you know, media mixing, um, TikTok has become a challenger. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's a big, big one as well. Uh, so last question here, as of right now, July, well, almost August 20, it'll be August. I think when people see this, maybe it'll be September. It might be September. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said a month, honestly, uh, as of right now, sometime in 2022, what are you or what is Western Rise doing really well? Um, and, and what are you not doing well enough? Yeah, Ooh, big questions. Uh, <laughs> um, what are we doing well? Um, we are making amazing products. Uh, right. Like product quality is like. I, I, I mean, mean, everybody knows that, right? Yeah. I. I, I <laughs> as much as like i know that's like the the cliche thing to do we actually have a new amazing like product partner that we brought on like almost a year ago that has helped us like take our product from here to like significantly better i didn't even mean that as like a slight like i actually do <laughs> think the product is nice. awesome thank you um so that is we're doing that really well um i would say like the other things that we're doing well is like really thinking outside of the box on how to do the the media mix and also like mm -hmm. innovative new ways to kind of like work within the channels that we're already working with and make them more effective. Um, so I'm really proud of that, especially like the partner program that we've built. And then the other thing is, is I think we're really starting to move into wholesale pretty well. Um, and the product that is getting into what we're calling influencer stores is actually selling really, really, really well. Um, which means, you know, we have a lot of growth in that channel to see in the future. Um, things that we could do better, uh, yeah. <laughs> operationally like wholesale is a whole different game <laughs> and just yeah. trying to learn like like the the routes and logistics and it like, ultimately uh, usually means a different team it, yeah it's it's basically like having to build out a whole second team specifically for that um and knowing how to do it right and also like you know how to talk to people in that space who've been you know running their grandfather's store or <laughs> and doing yeah. it forever and they have a, a dedicated way of doing things um so that's that's a new challenge for us, for us. And I think uh, two, like something that we could probably improve on is like continuing to like tell our story in a better way, uh, like a more concise, like better way. Um, as we expand into these new channels like print media and radio, it's just like a little bit different challenge than, you know, a direct response Facebook app that we were really good at. <laughs> so learning how to, to take that brand messaging and like really define it and, and then really like help push it through those, those channels is, is a different challenge. That is, yeah. So th that's a great call out because uh, there are a lot of digitally native brands out there that the reason that they really took off is because they have what you called add to market fit, meaning yeah. they have a very demonstrable product, right? Yeah. Somebody can look at an ad for a couple seconds and be like, oh, wow, that's cool. I get it. Yeah. You know, um, how do you do that on radio? You know what I mean? Like, how do you do It's that? really hard. Right. Yeah. So it's like, You've kind of lived in, in, and that's Western Rise. Like the products are like, you could show me five seconds of an ad or less, and I'll be like, "That's cool," I get it. you know. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, what do you do on print? What do you do on radio? That you know, that's difficult. It's like you know, there's there's kind of a multi level thing there where it's like, okay, really, we just kind of need to hook them to get them to go somewhere else where they can see how cool it is, right? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, the landing page needs to demonstrate that instead of the ad being able to demonstrate that. Whereas we used to be able to run those ads to just our PDP and they've already seen yeah. why it's 
So you know, like, it's, a, it's a very different journey. And uh, especially if you're a digitally native brand that was built on some kind of visual element like that, uh, you got to, yeah, you, you have to realize that. And if those channels aren't working for you and you're like, oh, yeah, I don't work, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe they don't, maybe they're not as good, but also maybe your whole brand was kind of built in this way that, you know, is digitally native and is video native and uh, you're not doing a good job of uh, adapting to a different medium. I think, you know, brands that have done well uh, and, and were able to scale across all these different channels as well, like did a great job from the start of also bringing the brand along instead of just pushing the, whatever that one core product was like crazy. Like there's that story behind the brand because a lot of times that's what you, are having to lead with in these other verticals is like come yeah. support the brand, not, not like, hey, we have pants that are water resistant. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's just a, it's just a different, it's a different yeah. model. Um, so I think like, you know, even for us, we're probably having to do a little bit of catch up of like, you know, what does the brand truly stand for, and why do you need to know the brand uh, instead of just why do you need to buy these specific pants? And it's just a little bit of a different, different method. Okay. Um, so we typically end our episodes with a parting shot. Uh, and that is, <laughs> I don't know, whatever it, I'm not, I hand it off to you. So take a second to think while I'm explaining it, but it's, it's more or less just like, you know, the TLDR or if it wasn't, if it's not a TLDR, just like as you're having this conversation, what's kind of the main thing uh, that you want that you're thinking about or that you think is important, you know, for anyone who's like, all right, what is, you know, what is growing an apparel brand? How do you do it? What does it look like? You know, what are, what's kind of like that main, if you learn nothing else, learn that. Yeah. Uh, growing an apparel brand, I think it comes down to really, you know, building your line smart, not over buying inventory, uh, like learning what true like add to market fit is and, bring your brand along the way so you can continue to scale across every channel. Beautiful. Got it. All right, Casey, get back in here and you're coming back. There you are. All right, cool. Uh, in case Will, anybody ever wonders where I am during episodes, I'm, I'm behind the scenes pushing buttons and stuff. Yeah. So. Okay. And the only <laughs> thing you guys see at the bottom, that's Casey changing that um, and the overlays and stuff. Uh, so Will, really appreciate you being here. This was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks yeah, for coming. Thanks, guys. Yeah, of course. Um, I think, I mean, that's it. Casey, say the YouTube things. All right, Modern Commerce. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm John. Thank you for setting up these interviews, as always. Um, if you have not already, Modern Commerce, please remember to uh, like the video, comment on the video, subscribe to our channel so that you can see more videos that pop up. If you really want to know when new videos drop, hit that notification bell so you'll get notified whenever we drop a new video onto our channel. And as always, until next time, we'll see ya. Hey, ModCom, this episode was brought to you by Pencil. I'm a creative strategist at the agency that John and I work at. If you happen to be a creative strategist or you're just having a hard time rolling out enough new creatives for testing, then I have the perfect solution for you. It's trypencil.com. Over at Pencil, the AI will help you determine what your best performers are. It'll even break it down into what elements of those best performers are helping making those ads go. And it'll also take those elements and create whole new ads for you to push live straight from their platform right over to Facebook and IG. So go to trypencil.com if you want to use this and use the promo code modcom15 to save 15% off of any paid plan they have over there. You can always start with a free plan. Uh, go ahead. Actually, I recommend it even, but we're confident you're going to want to upgrade as soon as you try it out. So just remember to go to trypencil.com, use the promo code modcom15 to save 15% off of any plan. And thank you for tuning in to Modern Commerce.